Today we continue our study on the subject of the resurrection of the dead. This is going to be the fourth session and if we complete everything in time, this would be the concluding session as well. Let's open our Bibles and go to the first epistle of Corinthians chapter 15 and we will read verses 22 and 23. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 and 23. For as in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Please keep in mind that right now we are not talking about the resurrection of all the dead people. In this passage, we are specified, and particularly in verse 22 and 23, we are talking specifically about the resurrection of those who are Christ or those who belong to Christ at His coming. That means there will be another resurrection because this resurrection is only for those who belong to Christ and that's going to take place when Christ appears in the clouds or in the sky. When this verse here is says those who are Christ is clear that it indicates ownership those who belong or those people on whom Christ has the ownership. Now who can say, who or I should say, who among us can say, I belong to Christ or I am Christ? I believe only those who have given the ownership of their lives to Jesus can say that. I believe these are the ones who carry the cross and follow Him on a daily basis as we read in Luke chapter 9 verse 23. And when I say this, a question may arise in your mind, do all born-again believers belong to Christ? Now that's a tough question. I will try to answer that or we will try to see the answer to this question together. Let's turn to the epistle of Second Timothy. Second Timothy, we'll go to chapter 2 and read verse 19. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19, I'm reading from God's word. In spite of all that, God's people have a solid foundation. These words are engraved on it. The Lord knows those who belong to Him. And whoever worships the Lord must turn from evil or give up doing wrong. The Lord knows those who belong to Him. And whoever worships the Lord must give up doing wrong. Those who are His or those who belong to Christ carry this seal. The Lord knows His own. That's part one of that seal. And there's another seal. Everyone who worships the Lord must turn away from evil or turn away from iniquity. Let's read this passage in the context. We'll start reading from verse 11. Verse 11 talks about if we died, that is, if we died to our old nature, we will live with Him. Verse 12 talks about we ruling with Him. Verse 14, ask the leaders to remind the believers these things. Then verse 15 is about winning God's approval. Verse 16 says, if you pay attention to pointless discussions, you will become more ungodly. Please do not forget we are talking about believers in Christ at this point. Then verse 17 says, verse 17 actually names two Christians or leaders. And verse 18 is about the damage they have brought to the body of Christ through on their wrong teaching about resurrection. And the discussion continues through verse 20 and 21. Verse 20 says, in a house, there are different kinds of vessels, vessels of gold and silver, but also vessels of wood and clay. Verse 21 says, those who, those who purge themselves from these, referring to whatever we have discussed earlier, those who make themselves clean from all, the, all those evil things will be used for special purposes because they are dedicated and useful to their master. They are ready to be used for every good deed. Now, if you will read verse 19 again, you will notice that the entire discussion presents indicators or parameters for God's own people. So, this gives us some clues about who are God's people or who are those who really belong to Jesus Christ. And I think the second sign is somewhat visible to others also. Or the second sign is visible to you as well as to others. Those who really belong to Jesus Christ turn away from evil. They live a life of repentance. They, they continually repent, change their thinking so that it aligns with God's thinking. Would you agree with me on that? Another verse that we can read to get some more information about those who belong to Christ is found in Galatians chapter 5. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5 and read verse 24. 
Galatians 5.24 Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their corrupt nature along with its passions and desires. Such believers who have crucified their flesh. So, th so this passage says those who really belong to Jesus have crucified their flesh. We know that flesh means the old or the sinful nature. What this verse tells us is that those who walk in the newness of life, that is those who regularly repent or change their old thoughts with God's thoughts, belong to Jesus. Now, these are not perfect Christians. These are not those who come to church every Sunday. These are not the first benchers who always give the correct answers to all the questions that is uh, uh, all the questions the teacher or pre preacher asks i believe these are believers who strive to leave the standards set by god these are believers who live a life of repentance they sin and make mistakes but they come back they bounce back they they come back through to repentance and they strive not to repeat those mistakes again galatians 5 21 says that those who practice the works produced by the old thinking pattern will not inherit the kingdom of God. So putting this all together, I think it gives you some idea as to who really belong to Christ. Now you may ask, what about John 3.16? Doesn't it say that anybody who believes in Jesus have eternal life? Yes, it does say, whoever believes will not perish, but will have eternal life. But here we are not talking about eternal life. We are talking about the kingdom of heaven. What about Romans 10, 9 and 10? Uh, doesn't Romans 9, 10 guarantee salvation to anyone who believes? Yes, it does. But we are not talking about salvation here or, or even eternal life. We are talking about the kingdom of heaven. Every born again believer will have eternal life. But he or she may not be a part of the first resurrection. Those believers who continue to walk in the old thinking or sinful nature may not inherit the kingdom. Those who belong to Christ will be resurrected at this point and they will be part of his kingdom on earth. Remember the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? That's a parable of the kingdom of heaven. Two servants walked by the Spirit and were given authority in the kingdom. The one who walked by his own old thinking did not enter the kingdom. He was sent to a place where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. You may again say, we do not see any kingdom here. So let's let's read Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 to 6. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither or neither has received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This account of the resurrection is another aspect of the resurrection that was not revealed to Paul in First Corinthians and in First Thessalonians. However, we can deduce two things from this passage. Those who are resurrected at this point are going to reign with Jesus for one thousand years. We see the kingdom now, don't we? Because they are going to reign with Christ. In order to reign, you need to have a kingdom. John says that this is the first resurrection. Now let's read verses 5 and 6 once more. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those who are part of this resurrection are blessed and holy. Galatians 5.16 gives as a remedy or a or a way that we can ensure that we are going to be a part of this resurrection and that remedy is to walk by the spirit walking by the spirit is primarily walking by the word of god these believers are going to be part of the resurrection at his coming this specific time is given there at his coming so those Mauryan christians who are walking by the spirit or who walk by the spirit are going to be a part of the resurrection this first resurrection at his coming those who belong to Christ, will be united with Christ at His coming. If they are dead, they will be resurrected. If they are alive, they will be changed instantaneously. Last time when I taught this section, somebody asked me a question from Matthew chapter 21, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 7. 
verses 21 to 23. Let's go and read that passage about what that those verses say. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the person who does what my Father in heaven wants. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we force out demons and do miracles by the power and authority of your name? Then I will tell them publicly, I have never known you. Get away from me, you evil people. Jesus said many will use miracles, prophecies, or prophesying and casting out demons as the password to enter the kingdom. Is this passage about believers or non-believers? Well, I will leave it to you. The answer is clear. He warned in advance that these are wrong passwords. There's only one correct password, and that is found in verse 21. Only the person who does what my Father in heaven wants. Even calling Jesus Christ Lord will not work. You will get a message, wrong password. When you, when you try to use uh, Lord or calling Jesus Lord as a password. Let's now go to First Thessalonians chapter 4. We read from verse 13 to verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who have died. We don't want you to grieve like other people who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and came back to life. We also believe that through Jesus, God will bring back those who have died. They will come back with Jesus. We are telling you what the Lord taught. We who are still alive when the Lord comes will not go into the kingdom ahead of those who have already died. The Lord will come from heaven with a command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the dead who believe in Christ will come back to life. Then together with them, we who are still alive will be taken in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. In this way, we will always be with the Lord. So then comfort each other with these words. One purpose of this passage is to give comfort to believers about their relatives or friends if they have died in Christ or slept in Christ, they will be resurrected. This resurrection is to enter into the kingdom. So let's uh, briefly look at this passage and see what all is listed here. First, there will be a shout from Jesus, as he said in John 5.28. All in the grave will hear his voice. Only Christ's voice has the power to call the dead out of the graves. Please remember, only true believers are going to be raised. Then there will be the sound of the archangel. Finally, the trumpet of God will be blown. I believe from what we read here, it is not going to be a quiet event. The non-believers are going to see it. In the Bible, the trumpet call is mainly given for people to gather for a purpose. This time, it would be for God's people to gather to meet their Lord. Hallelujah! The word gathering together, in this passage that we read, we see that the Lord is going to shout, and then the Lord Jesus Christ is going to call out to the believers, then there is going to be the, the sound of the archangel calling, and finally the trumpet of God. Some additional information about this this uh, event is given in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, and I would like to read that with you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to become unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. In this passage, in verse 1, it talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to Him. The word gathering here is an interesting word and I would like to give you some insight about it. The Greek word used here is episunagoge. And as soon as I said that word, some of you, some of you might have already begun to understand what I'm going to say. The word episunagoge means a complete or a final gathering. Now, why I'm talking about this Greek word in this context? Because every Sunday and sometimes on weekdays also, we gather to worship Jesus. Isn't that true? And that gathering in the Greek language is synagogue, transliterated into English as synagogue. So, this Sunday gathering at different locations of the earth is a copy, or I, can, I should say a miniature copy, 
what is going to happen on the day those who sleep in Christ are resurrected. So the gatherings or our church meetings are small sunagage and the gathering on that day when Jesus returns to this earth will be episunagage, the great, the great gathering, the complete and final gathering. So those who belong to Christ will be part of this resurrection. Believers will be raised. Believers will be raised or changed in swift succession. Then by God's power, they will be pulled up into the clouds to meet Jesus. And as I said, this is not going to be a quiet event. This is going to be a spectacular event. Matthew 24, verses 27 to 31, gives a lot of details about the coming of the Christ. And there it says, as lightning. And if you would if you would like to, we can read Matthew 24, verse 27. Let's read that together. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So when the Lord comes, His coming is going to be visible to the entire earth. Just like and there's a lightning, even though it begins in the east, it is visible to the west or in the west. Revelation 1.7 says, Every eye will see Him. Second Peter 3, chapter 3, verses 10 to 13, that passage makes it very clear that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth, He's going to come as a thief in the night. In Matthew 24, the Lord warned His people not to believe if someone says Christ is here or there. But He said, when I come, everybody's going to know. When I come, I'll come quickly like lightning and it's going to be visible to all the people. So don't just believe when somebody says Christ has already come and He's here or there. So such deception will take place before the coming of the Lord. That's why the Lord warned. Now, some of you must be familiar with the word rapture in the context of Christ coming to this earth. You don't see that word rapture in any of the English translations because that word rapture is not English, actually. In First Thessalonians, we read, when the Lord comes with the sound of the archangel and the trumpet call, and then those who are dead in Christ will rise, and those who are alive will change, and they will be caught up to Him to meet the Lord in the air. That word caught up, when translated into Latin, is rapture. The Greek word is harpazo, the Latin word is rapture. So you hear a lot of teachers talking about the rapture, referring to the coming of the Lord and our gathering to the land team. I'll just give you this information so that you know what rapture is. In this passage, we need to pay attention to this caught up. We will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. This is a sudden snatching by force. Jesus said he will come like a thief also in Revelation chapter 16 verse 15. He will come like a thief, not as a thief. Or he will not be a thief, but he will come like a thief. Or he will come in the manner of it. And first of all, we need to remember he's using this comparison about his coming, not about him or about his nature. He says, he said, when I come, I will come like a thief. That means he will come without any prior warning. That's number one. Number two, he will snatch away the true believers. So it's going to be one single, swift, sudden, violent act. That is what rapture in Latin means. A single, swift, sudden, violent act. So this action of coming without prior warning and taking away something by force is the nature of a thief. But we need to we need to remember this. A thief will take whatever he can get, although he always looks for valuable things. But he always takes things that do not belong to him. However, Jesus will take only what is his. That is, the most valuable thing on the earth, his people. But he will come like a thief only and act like a thief only in the aspect of suddenly showing up and taking his people. He will not be like a thief in any other thing because he will take only those who belong to him. Then the Bible says we will meet the Lord in the air. That's in verse 17. When we read Second Thessalonians chapter 2, talking about the gathering of the saints, we read that that event will not occur till there is a rebellion or falling away from faith and the son of perdition or destruction is revealed. That means the coming of the Lord is not going to take place until there is a falling away from faith, which means some people or a lot of people are going to move away from faith in Jesus. 
they will they will be attracted by other things more charming and deceitful things and then Christ will that passage also gives us information that along with the falling away from faith the son of perdition or destruction is going to be revealed that is the antichrist so so if you're looking at the timeline the coming of the lord to gather his saints will occur after there is a falling away from from faith and as the antichrist is revealed also uh, we read about the resurrection from the 20th chapter of revelation and we notice that that took place after the false prophet and the beast begin to work on earth so when we put together all these different passages and the insights we have gathered from those passages we learn that there are different phases to the first resurrection number 1 christ is the first one to be resurrected along with the old testament saints and when i say along with the old testament saints i mean the record in matthew 27 verses 51 to 53 you can take the time to read that passage there you will see after the lord was crucified the tombs of some old testament or several old testament saints were open and they were resurrected after jesus christ was resurrected and why some old testament saints were resurrected along with jesus a possible explanation is in john chapter 12 verse 24 where jesus said i can guarantee this truth a single grain of wheat does not produce anything unless it is planted in the ground and dies if it dies it will produce a lot of grain so what happened is when jesus christ died and like a seed that is sown on the ground or it goes under the soil or under the earth jesus christ died he was placed in a tomb he went under the earth figuratively and when he was resurrected along with him several other saints were resurrected just like when you plant a seed it goes under the earth it sprouts and then brings up a plant and then we see a lot of fruits in there not just one seed we see a lot of fruits in there with many seeds in it so that's that's a, that's the insight i get from this but i leave it to you to draw your conclusions i think that is one of the one of the possible explanations for old testament saints being resurrected along with jesus but you can draw your own conclusions now let's go to first corinthians again and read the verse that we started off with first corinthians chapter 15 verse 22 23 for us in adam all die even so in christ shall all be made alive then it says in verse 23 but every man in his own order christ the first fruits we talked about christ who is the first one to be resurrected afterward they that are at his coming it is verse 23 we discuss about those who are christ at his coming verse 24 then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to god the father after he has destroyed all dominion authority and power along with this passage we will also read revelation chapter 20 verse 4 to 6 revelation chapter 20 verses 4 5 and 6 and i saw thrones and they that sat upon and judgment was given unto them and i saw the souls of them that were beheaded for for the witness of jesus and for the word of god and which had not worshiped the beast neither his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished this is the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years john clearly tells us that this is the first resurrection the first resurrection began with jesus as we discussed earlier he is the first fruit of the resurrected after christ was resurrected some old testament believers were also resurrected and we already talked about that it culminates with the resurrection of those who belong to him we talked about that old testament believers who believed and looked forward to the coming of the messiah and the new testament believers both dead and alive will be part of 
this resurrection. This happens actually after a time gap of more than 2,000 years. But remember, God is not affected by time. Now we can say this after 2,000 years. At that time when it was written, we didn't know when this res resurrection would take place. Or I should say, this resurrection of the believers at the coming of the Lord will happen after a time gap of more than 2,000 years. As of now, I don't know how many more years or centuries we have to wait. But as of now, we can say it would it will take place after a gap of more than 2,000 2, years. But remember, God is not affected by time. Then there is a record of two witnesses who were martyred. They were resurrected after three and a half days. We read that in Revelation chapter 11, verses 9, 11, and 12. We also read about martyrs of the tribulation period, both Jews and Gentiles, in this passage of Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. When all believers have gone from earth, only non-believers will be left here. That's just common sense, right? At some point, Jesus will judge the nations of the world, as written in Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32. However, I still do not know the exact time and the conditions in which that judgment is going to take place. So I'm not going to spend much time on this right now. I will try to study it again and if I get any more insight, I will definitely bring it to you. We read in this passage in Revelation 20 that the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. Those who are part of this first resurrection will reign with Christ for a thousand years. During this period, Jerusalem will be the earthly center for Christ's kingdom and administration to rule over all the nations. Now we will read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24 and 26. Then Christ will hand over the kingdom to God the Father as he destroys every ruler, authority, and power. Verse 25. Christ must rule until God has put every enemy under his control. Verse 26. The last enemy he will destroy is death. The end in this verse refers to the end of Christ's reign on the earth for 1,000 years. The Greek word used here means conclusion of a specific purpose. So at the end of his earthly reign, he will deliver up the kingdom to the Father. Then there will be another resurrection. This passage in, in Corinthians chapter 15 does not give us any further information about the second resurrection. So we will go to Revelation 20 and read verse 7. When 1,000 years are over, Satan will be freed from his prison. When released, Satan will go back to his old work of deceiving people. He will gather all the nations to fight against Israel. Verses 10, 11, 12, and 13. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were also thrown. They will be tortured day and night forever and ever. I saw a large white throne and the one who was sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but no place was found for them. I saw the dead, both important and unimportant people, standing in front of the throne. Books were opened, including the book of life. The dead were judged on the basis of what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up it's dead. Death and hell gave up their dead. People were judged based on what they had done. The rest of the dead from the beginning of human history till that time will be resurrected in the second resurrection. They will be judged, each one according to his or her works. If their names are in the book of life, they will be spared. When we study the eternal judgment, which is again another foundation doctrine, we will cover this in detail. The majority of those who will be resurrected at this point seems to be unbelievers. John uses the term dead for this group of people. They are resurrected only to face judgment. They are still dead in their trespasses and sins. Now you may recall referring to those who belong to Jesus, Paul through the Holy Spirit said those who sleep in the Lord or those who sleep in Christ. However, there will be two categories of people who will be spared. Let's go to Luke chapter 11, 31 and 32. The queen of south will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn 
it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. These people did not have a full revelation of Christ's atoning sacrifice as given in the book of the law and prophets, but they responded to the limited information they had been given. Therefore, they will stand apart and they will be spared. Will there be any other group? We do not know. Only one thing is clear. Those who have heard and rejected the gospel of Christ have no further chance to receive God's mercy because by rejecting, they have closed the doors forever and sealed their own destiny. What were the people who died during the thousand-year period of Christ's reign on this earth? Now, we are not talking about the resurrected believers because they are not going to die. But those who have remained on the earth after the first resurrection. A prophecy in Isaiah indicates that some will believe in Jesus during that period. Isaiah 65 verse 20 Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered a curse. So there will be some who will be spared and some who will not be. Some will believe and thereby they will be given mercy at that judgment. Now, Let's read Revelation 20 again, verse 14 of Revelation 20. It says, Death and hell were thrown into the fiery lake. The fiery lake is the second death. And remember, we are reading from Revelation 20. I skipped uh, several verses, but I would encourage you to read the whole chapter to give a better understanding of what we are discussing. In order to save time, I skipped those verses. It will give you a better understanding of the context. This particular verse says that death and hell were thrown into the fiery lake. Death, as we know, is a state of being separated from the spirit. Hell, or grave, or Hades in English, or Hades in the Greek, we know, is the place where the spirits of the unrighteous go after they are separated from their bodies. However, there is more to it. In order to understand this, we will read Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. Revelation chapter 6, verse 8. I looked, and there was a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. Hell followed him. They were given power over one-fourth of the earth to kill people using wars, famines, plagues, and the wild animals on the earth. The New Testament, or the book of Revelation, gives some more insight about death and hell. John saw death and hell as persons. Only a person can sit on a horse. So, death is a spirit, the messenger or minister of Satan, who claims the spirit of every unrighteous person when he or she dies. Similarly, hell is a spirit who follows death close upon the heel and takes the spirits of the unrighteous to their assigned place. So hell or Hades is named after the messenger of Satan under whose custody the spirits remain till the resurrection. I think I made it very clear. Death, a state where the spirit is separated from the body, but death is also a spirit, a messenger or minister of Satan. Similarly, hell or Hades or grave is a place where the, the spirits of the unrighteous go after their death, but Hades or hell is also a spirit who takes the custody of the spirits of the unrighteous people and keeps them in their custody till their resurrection. Jesus made a declaration in John chapter 8. Let's go to John chapter 8, verse, we'll read verse 51. I can guarantee this truth. Whoever obeys what I say will never see death. Now by saying this, Jesus did not say a person who keeps his word will never die, but he will never see death or the dark angel or minister of Satan. A true believer after his death will not be claimed by the messenger of Satan called death. His or her spirit will never go to hell or Hades. Rather, the angels will carry him or her to Abraham's bosom as we read in Luke 16.22. I think I have somewhat covered all aspects of the resurrection of the dead and discuss with you all the important points about these two resurrections. Before we conclude, I would like to discuss with you the unique importance of resurrection. Why is resurrection so important and why is it a foundation doctrine? 
Resurrection is a proof or evidence that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I think that is the number one importance of resurrection. Before his crucifixion, Jesus, our Lord, stood before two different courts. The first one was the Jewish religious court. The Jewish authorities rejected Jesus, even though he came to this earth as the Son of God, to deliver both the Jews and the Gentiles. But he came primarily to his own people, the Jewish people, and the Jewish authorities rejected him. The civil or the political authorities represented by Pilate also rejected Jesus. And after Jesus died, the Jewish authorities sealed the tomb where Jesus was buried. Roman authorities, through Pilate, provided the army backup to protect the tomb. So what we see here is that both the authorities not only rejected Jesus' claim to be the Son of God, but they also used their power to seal Jesus' fate forever. But God intervened and Jesus was resurrected and he came out of the tomb. Hallelujah! In the epistle to Romans, Paul introduced Jesus Christ in a very special manner. Let us read Romans chapter 1 verse 4. Talking about Jesus Christ, in verse 4 he says, In his spiritual holy nature, he was declared the Son of God. This was shown in a powerful way when he came back to life or when he was resurrected. Resurrection proved that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. Praise the Lord and Amen. I get excited when I talk about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The second importance of the resurrection is that resurrection of Jesus Christ is a guarantee that any repentant person will receive forgiveness of sins and salvation. Let's read Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 verse 25. It says, talking about Jesus who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification or for our justification. If there were no resurrection, there would have been no justification of a sinner. Romans 10, 9 says that in order to receive salvation and to be justified, one has to confess Jesus as Lord and then believe in the heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You don't get salvation by confessing Jesus as Lord alone. You have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul, talking to Corinthians in the, in the first epistle, in the 15th chapter, explained that the gospel that he preached was about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the clear message the apostles preached in the first century. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, read verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. This was a clear message the apostles preached in the first century. Apostle Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach that point very clearly in the above passage. So Paul not only preached and taught that, but he also wrote that in the epistle when he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to make it clear that the gospel of salvation is, and also the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus is incomplete without the message of resurrection. Then in the 17th verse of the same chapter, Paul says by the Holy Spirit that if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. So he makes it very clear that if Christ were not resurrected or if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead or if there was no resurrection, you're still in your sins. That means the forgiveness, the redemption is incomplete without the resurrection of Jesus. His dying on the cross alone does not guarantee your salvation. It has to do with His resurrection also. So I don't think one can be saved by saying, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me and come into my heart. That's a popular 
evangelical message these days, but I don't think that works. The Bible clearly says if you believe, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Third reason or importance of the resurrection is that it is our hope. We do not believe in Jesus just to have healings and provisions or a happy life of some 80 to 90 or maximum 120 years upon this earth. We live on this earth with that great and blessed hope of resurrection and eternal life. The Apostle Paul himself looked forward to the resurrection. Hope in the future resurrection kept him going. It provided the necessary impetus for his ministry. In Philippians chapter 3 verses 10, 11, and 12, Paul made a remarkable statement and made it very clear that he was looking forward to the resurrection. Let's read from verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And here Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. If by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul did not want anything to prevent him from attaining the completion of all his beliefs and labors, the resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead is another important foundation doctrine. As followers of Jesus, we need a clear scriptural understanding of it. This should be one of the layers of our Christian foundation as we run this race of life with patience. Before I close, I just want to share something with you. One of the first things I did after the Lord called me to the ministry was to study the foundation doctrines of the Bible. My mentor, Apostle Lloyd, gave me a book written by Derek Prince. And that book was about foundation doctrines of the Bible. Of course, Derek Prince is one of the best teachers I know who teaches with clarity, simplicity, and uh, as far as I can say, with great accuracy. So I should say I did not deliberately study the foundation doctrine, but I was led to it at that time. And then as I studied, I realized the importance of the foundation doctrines. And recently, I felt I should teach foundation doctrines again. In fact, some time ago, my wife Rena told me, I think you should teach that you should teach people about the resurrection of the dead. I heard what she said, but immediately I didn't have any urge to teach about it. But a few days later, I began to have this desire. And there was some compelling force in that, that I realized I should teach it. So I, be, I studied the subject once again. I reviewed my previous studies and refined it and uh, I tried to present a simple teaching on the subject of resurrection this time. I enjoyed teaching it and I believe it has been a blessing for everyone who listened to it live or through podcast. Before closing, I would like to say that I did not teach everything that one can possibly know from the Bible about resurrection. If the Lord wills, I will refine this study again sometime in the future and I will try to present it with more clarity, with more accuracy. If you have any questions about what we have discussed so far, please feel free to email your questions to ocomersharvestnet at gmail.com. God bless you. It has been wonderful teaching this subject and spending time with you.